Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Lecture 5A for our Site Management course. Uh, today we're going to be looking at job site layout and control. So there's a lot of things that are involved with job site layout and uh, things of site logistics. Uh, site logistics, really it's, it's a big part of this course that we're teaching. Uh, it's how you organize the site, it's how productive you are on the site, and there's a lot of what I'd call space between the spaces in being really good at setting up a site and making it very productive during the different phases. So it's a constant evolving process that you go through um, when you're developing and you're building and you're planning and you're closing out a project. There's a, there's a variety of stages that are involved in a project and site logistics is always adjusting and evolving to best suit those uh, different phases of work. So it is a, a very sort of practical approach. It's uh, an engaged approach with the various sub-trades and suppliers. And really what you're trying to do is ensure that the job goes as easily as possible, that everything is being facilitated in place. So that's part of your uh, process. Um, so site logistics uh, it really involves answering the questions of who, what, when, where, why and how and as you can see in this picture up here this photograph this is up at Concord uh, Adax they're building a whole pile of condominiums up along Shepherd Avenue between Bayview and Leslie Street there's a lot of coordination that's involved in a process like this and this is the essence of site logistics you know trying to ensure that you have the right number of uh, dump trucks coming, the right number of excavators, that the work is coordinated. Uh, if you've got concrete trucks ordered and they're delivering concrete, that it's in a timely fashion. The goal is to have as little wasted motion and wasted cost as possible. And so every site is very unique uh, and requires careful planning for you to be successful. So site logistics is really about breaking down the site, how you'll lay it out, and how you'll best utilize it. And as you'll see, there's, you know, with every site, there's constraints. You're sort of dealt this hand of constraints. Are we up in a farmer's field um, north of Barrie and we're putting a new college campus for Georgian College? Or are we in downtown Toronto and we're on a little postage stamp and we've got no space uh, to move, as you'll see in some of the slides? Um, so, um, we think about uh, the overall site logistics as in components, and one is obviously the job site layout. So we have to have a plan for how uh, we're going to set up temporary facilities. You know, where is the trailer going to be, the offices for the, the management team, um, how are we going to uh, order the material, where are we going to place it when it arrives, how are we going to time the placement. How are we going to coordinate that with the trades? They're having materials delivered on an ongoing basis. How do we ensure that material from one trade doesn't get in the way of material from another trade, that nothing uh, basically blocks the flow of work? So all these things we have to think about. And we can, areas of consideration, we can break this down into is like material handling, uh, labor productivity, equipment constraints, and site constraints. So we'll be looking at these in both lectures 5A and 5B as they come up. Again, you can see that these are, um, you've got your uh, uh, concrete trucks, you've got basically a mobile crane, you've got um, your um, driving equipment, which is for your shoring that's going to be going in. Uh, you got a number of things going on all at once in this uh, area. It's a fairly large area and they're lucky that they do have fairly good staging areas for being in the city and all, um, but you have to still coordinate this work. Uh, when I was in London, England a few years ago, um, I went and I looked at the Leadenhall building and I think I mentioned it, maybe I'll put it in the notes. Uh, there's a uh, PBS uh, special on uh, the construction of the Leaden Hall building and it was done completely with BIM, a lot of prefabrication and one of the biggest reasons for all of that prefabrication 
was like it's in London, England. You think Toronto is a crowded city? Go to London, England. You'll see what a crowded city is. And it was right in the heart of the financial district. And so there really wasn't very much room to move. So a lot of the building is prefab. Even the mechanical systems, which are built largely in the spine of the building, were prefabricated off site. And so that required extra, extra site logistics and coordination and management uh, for that. So I'll try to put the, um, uh, the link to the video, I think it's on YouTube, uh, in the uh, notes for this video for those that are interested. Really interesting um, video for you to take a look at and see the logistical issues that you have to deal with. You know what? Most urban centers, very similar problems that you run into that way. So um, we think about uh, the uh, job site layout plan. Um, we think about what space do we have? Uh, what's our access? Uh, material handling, worker transportation, temporary facilities, job site security, signage and barricades. So we can think of things in these terms uh, so we can sort of help better um, uh, look at how we're gonna break down the site. Uh, in this case here, you've got a prefabricated stairs uh, which would be for this multi-story buildings that are going to be craned off the truck and they're going to be put into place as the building is being constructed uh, saves a lot of time and a lot of effort having these prefabricated right if you had to fabricate them on site that would be a lot of work and you'd have a lot of issues with quality control too much easier to do in a factory condition under more stringent conditions than on site so there's a lot of advantages to prefabrication where it where it works and where it makes sense so the handling of material and we'll get into this a little bit too uh, is um, determining well how do we get it to its point of placement with the least amount of effort possible and so obviously putting formwork up on top of a rising condominium building using a tower crane makes a lot of sense can quickly move material up and down but there's a lot of logistics in behind even using a tower crane uh, there's overhead rights you can't just swing a tower tower tr well you can but somebody that's uh, a little bit educated may all of a sudden uh, slap you with a stop work order because you didn't get permission uh, so you have to negotiate overhead rights if it goes over a particular property. If that doesn't work because you can't get the overhead rights, uh, you might have to use a different type of crane, like a luffer crane. I think I've got an image later in the video. And that one doesn't necessarily have to be hanging over somebody else's uh, property. And often, if you want to put it over somebody's property, you have to pay them for that airspace. So... Uh, you want to deliver it as close as possible uh, to its location. And then you've got to also make sure contractually, well, who's taking it off the truck and who's putting it where, etc. Those things have to be worked out. I know some subtrades think that the GC is supposed to take it off the truck for them. Um, so you have to make sure that uh, those things are clarified in the contract and in the pre-award meetings and the pre-construction meetings and the weekly meetings. So these uh, things get um, reinforced. And you don't want to move material more than once. You only want to move it once. I think I may have mentioned before uh, who I apprenticed under the bricklayer. And, you know, if you didn't put his blocks exactly a certain way or the bricks a certain way, you didn't have the mortar to the right mix, um, he would get very upset because it meant he had to do it again. He had to move the block. He had, so he had to move it once to get it into position and another time to put it in the wall. So you multiply that over a day, that's hundreds of extra lifts and movements that are unnecessary. So that's going to cause waste. And waste, waste is a big concern in construction. And construction, depending what you're reading, we have somewhere between 32 and 70% waste in construction lot of waste. We'll talk about that a little bit in a few slides. So you also want to have material, and this is from lean construction, uh, have material delivered at the earliest responsible moment. That means you don't want to have it too early. What's the earliest that you can have it delivered responsibly, meaning that it'll be there for the people when they need it or what the trades need it. If you have it delivered too soon, uh, it sits there. If it sits there, it's going to get damaged, or you're going to have to move it, or it's going to get stolen. Also, you have to pay for it because 
you paid for it for a couple of months early to sit there, you've already paid that money out. You could have waited before you had it delivered. So it could cause cash flow issues potentially. So these are all things that we think about. So most responsible uh, moment uh, or earliest responsible moment, not too early, um, is sort of a, a catchphrase that we use in lean construction. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it's not always used in traditional construction. Anticipate equipment needs. Um, so you're always thinking ahead, what are you gonna need? Because if you don't, you may not get it when you need it. So that's that responsibility side of things. Select the optimum material, moving equipment according to cost, availability, safety, material quantity, access to point of use, adequate delivery routes, coordination of deliveries. There's a lot there. It's a lot to consider. You know, we don't just look at, oh, this is, so, this is cheaper. We're going to save money on this particular item. Meanwhile, it causes everything else on the project more grief and maybe whatever you're saving by paying less for something is costing you 10 times more with all the interruptions and problems. Oh, we're going to save uh, $500 on, these, uh, on the drywall order. Let's order it now and then we can, we'll make that $500 savings. So now you got it stuck on your site and you're having to move it three and four times. Some of it's becoming damaged. It's interrupting the flow of work and you've actually spent about $3,000 extra than the $500 that you saved. Not worth it. So those are things to think about. Even this here I noticed uh, was um, for this um, restaurant that was going in. They had all the ceramic tile delivered way um, before that they were ready for it. And so it was already in place. This was here for quite a while. Um, so if you get something way ahead of time, that can cause um, so some, uh, some area problems because maybe now you got to get the drywall and this wall in behind here and this is all in the way. You got to move it again. Um, this one, it looks like they're ready to put the drywall on, so they have it off to the side. Doesn't look like it's blocking the runway. They had the drywall on this side, so they shouldn't have to move it. It was even taped, that section of wall, by the look of it. Uh, that was probably, um, this is the fit out of the, of the building. This was probably done originally. And so that's probably a little bit better situation from that perspective. So you wanna make arrangements for material or equipment to be placed in the installation area. And you want to make it a systematic process, so as organized as possible. Sometimes if you've got repeti repetition of things, you might want to set up that every two or three days your supplier is bringing X, Y, Z of materials. Not everything on Monday. Maybe they're bringing some on Monday, some on Wednesday, some on Friday. Uh, have staging areas where you can, and lay down areas where you can uh, put uh, materials. So lay down is where you want to store some materials. Staging is where it's in transition to go to another place within the site. Uh, you want to sort it upon its delivery. And if possible, if it's being ordered, say, from a lumber yard, you want the materials to be loaded on the skid a certain way so that you don't have to go to the bottom of the skid to get at the materials where you're starting from. And then, so for example, you don't want to have uh, the roofs on uh, the roof trusses on top of the skids of lumber, and then you got to take all the roof trusses off because first you got to build the floors and the walls before you get going, right? So you'd want to have it loaded uh, if you have a, a lumber delivery with the joists coming on first, and then your stud material, your wall materials next, right? Um, so you're thinking about how you're going to be removing the materials from the delivery. Sometimes these little things can make a big difference in the flow of work on site and your ability to be efficient. A material hoist uh, with a tower crane in the background here. So this is your material hoist. We use that to move materials from one floor to the other or from the ground floor up to the floors. It can also move people as well. Uh, we do want to be careful that we're not holding up a whole load of materials uh, with uh, basically because there's a group of people just going up and down when they could have easily taken the stairs. So we sometimes very often have to coordinate a schedule for deliveries with the material hoist so it gets prioritized, especially for critical path items. We also have to think about, do we need one material hoist or do we need two material hoists? What would be the most efficient on this uh, particular uh, project? So we're always thinking about the, the movement of materials. We also have to think about if we're enclosing the building, do we leave this section till the very end? Is it designed that we can leave this section to the very end? 
and then close it in because the longer we have the material hoist there, the easier it is to move the materials to the various floors. Once we take this material hoist out, we have to make sure that one of the elevators is now working and then that the elevator insides is protected uh, if we're actually going to be moving using it as like a freight elevator, right? So we have to consider that in our site logistics plan. How long can we keep this viably um, open without having the finished cladding on it? What type of material hoist? How many? What kind of capacity does it have? Uh, all of those things come into play. So there you see one, they've got double material hoist. Here's capacity issues. So you're trying to make sure that you design the right one that's not too expensive, but that's going to deliver the right amount of um, product uh, in a timely fashion. And you can think about this uh, when they built the, uh, what was it, One Bluer Street, uh, <coughs> excuse me, One Bluer Street East, um, uh, Tucker High Rise, they, it was a great golf building, Tucker High Rise, they had utilized this special extra fast um, elevator, elevating system within the building. Uh, when they were building it and it was in the newspapers uh, how much time and how much money this elevator system was actually saving them because it was an 80-story building something like 78 80 floors you can imagine if it can go really fast up and down instead of waiting and waiting and waiting and people waiting for the elevator the clock is ticking people are getting paid on an hourly rate you start multiplying that by hundreds of workers on a project doesn't take long before you're into hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. We have a large cooling tower here. So also we have to think about, I mentioned closing in. Well, you also have to think about the tower crane and equipment that's coming. So when do we take the tower crane down? Can we time it that we have certain equipment that we can put into place? Because if we don't, then we have to uh, get a mobile crane uh, for those periods and how logistically easy is it that as long as you've considered it and you've worked it through um, those are possibilities right that need to be considered uh, how do we move certain pieces of material like concrete is it going to be more cost effective for us to have the concrete pumped into position instead of using buckets you got to remember when you're using buckets that the crane is now um, focused on moving concrete and it can't be moving rebar and it can't be moving conduits and piping systems and things like that. Um, so it can cause conflicts, but maybe if we have it pumped into place, uh, then we don't need the crane for that aspect of it and the crane is freed up. That could have huge implications as well. Depends on the complexity of the building. This was for Humber River Hospital, so it's a fairly complex building. Um, maybe for a condominium, it might not make sense. So um, some of the things uh, you need to consider, as we said, how the materials will flow onto the site um, to their required destination. Uh, there's a lot of variability as how this will happen. Uh, the timing of deliveries, uh, maybe there's traffic closing off a lane on the street if you don't have room to drive it in. And so, as I mentioned, some sites have a great deal of space while others don't and figuring out how the material will be moved to its final position is really critical to the success of the project. So we may have to use individual schedules uh, that tie the material hoisting and the crane usage to the short-term schedules, which tie to the master schedule for the project. So there needs to be an interconnection between the critical activities, the short-term uh, look-ahead schedules, and uh, major equipment usage to make sure it's maximized so that it's not causing delays on the project. So this is what we call a crane and material hoist schedule uh, where the cranes are being scheduled and the material hoist is being scheduled for what, when. And this would, this would be prioritized on a weekly basis. So there's that interconnection that I was mentioning. You have this long-term project schedule, which has a critical path, things in red, uh, things with floater in blue. And then you do usually a two or three week look ahead schedule in traditional construction methods. And so that looks at two weeks ahead and what just happened in the previous week. So you might be right here and you're planning out the next two weeks, knowing what just happened and coordinating with the trades. So you have weekly site meetings 
uh, with the trades and they'll be coordinating their deliveries as well. And so you set up a equipment schedule where you can prioritize the crane and the material hoist in this process. And so this section here would be looking at the two weeks coming up. This would be detailing it out in more detail because you can't get the, the granular detail on a master schedule which you develop at the beginning of the project the way you can with something that's coming up in two weeks from now. And so this gets these major items get detailed out into more detail so that you can coordinate it better, improve the flow of work. And then as this happens, it feeds back up into the master schedule so you can update the master schedule. That way you can see if you're ahead, behind, you're on, on time, whereabouts you are on the project. Labor productivity is a big deal in construction and it's the most unpredictable. In estimating, it's the most difficult to do. Uh, quant uh, quantity takeoffs aren't so bad. But estimating labor depends on the crews. It depends on their experience. It depends on the complexity of work. It depends on how well the project is, is set up and the site logistics. Um, so uh, we think about uh, the, um, there's what we call the value added and the non-value added. So value added is physically driving nails into a finished product on the project. Non-value added really is putting even form work up. It, you're not, it's not at the end of the day, the walls of the building. So there's a lot of things that you do and there's what we call necessary value added, like putting form work up and unnecessary value added, right? Like going down to the truck down 20 floors on a material hoist because you forgot something in the truck. And then it takes you 10 minutes to go down and 10 minutes to come back up, maybe longer and that time is uh, wasted. So uh, we have to think about things, movement on a site, um, even to something simple like a washroom, coffee breaks, lunch, moving material and asking questions. Um, so you have to think the, about the average and quickest way to trans transport labor for the minimum amount of time. And um, you really wanna uh, think about optimizing uh, transportation. So like I said with material hoist you might have to have a schedule that prioritizes the material over people using it, right? Or you might have to think about uh, using the crane uh, to move a lot of the items uh, depending what stage of work you're at. Sometimes the crane's not going to do it for you. You have to use the material hoist. So um, that's that's part and parcel of that process. I think a good example um, when I think about it and your book has a somewhat similar example. Uh, basically, electrician costs $40 per hour in direct costs, and they work eight hours per day. And there's 10 electricians working at the rear of a large site. All very possible. Uh, their total direct cost is $3,200 per day, and they'll be working in this area for the next two months. The site's laid out with only one temporary washroom, and it's down beside the construction trailer, which is a five minute walk around the building with an on average two minute wait to get into the washroom. So um, the time that the electrician spends on average using the washroom four times per day is 40 minutes a day. You know, you've got the four times, you've got five minutes going there, you got times two because you got to come back. Uh, you've got uh, the two minute wait times four, add that up. So you've got a total of 40 minutes, 48 minutes per day. Each or 480 minutes, 48 times 10, uh, uh, per day for the 10 electricians. Walking to, walking back, waiting, walking, waiting. And uh, that, add, that adds up. You know, if we put a dollar value to that and we run through the dollars, that's eight hours wasted every day on the electricians. Walking, waiting, walking back and forth. In terms of dollars, if we assume that $40 per hour, and you're never gonna find an electrician for 40 bucks an hour, never. So that's a very low number. Um, I should double it, really, it'd be closer to it if we were talking the burdened rate of an electrician. When we talk about WSIP costs, we talk about EI costs, we talk about insurance costs, we talk about other things. Um, so we, we come up with that number. So 20 working days each month, so that's two months, 40 days and we come up with $12,800 wasted. Um, so 
you know that's why it's important to think about this process and in this case it would pay dividends to install another portable washroom maybe that's two hundred dollars per month uh, at the rear of the building that's a very small cost i was low on the electrician price i'm low on this price i could probably double that one too um, but doesn't matter uh, it's it, the numbers really tell the story so the net savings 12,800 minus the 200 times 2 so $12,400 you would save by having that extra washroom close by the work and it's something that you want to think about having that washroom close by the work most construction projects will get that pretty good although I still see some that don't um, you'll see them uh, moving it up to each floor where they're working, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Uh, but some still don't. In fact, when I was doing some of my consulting with this and I was doing it, some training for a, a large group, I did this example. And then I kind of said, you know, I know you likely know this and this is a pretty simple example. And when I was done, one of the vice presidents came up to me and said, actually we have this this problem is perfect because we have currently a million dollar claim about how far we had the temporary washrooms we're even going with stopwatches to see how long it took from one place to the other it wasn't even that they were losing money because of the extra time it was a sub trade said they lost money and the contract was the contractor was supposed to put the washrooms in close proximity to the work so on a very big project, it could definitely turn out to be that kind of money. Um, other one examples similar to that you could think about. You could think about, I had one again, another uh, vice president, uh, and it was for a heavy civil company in Newfoundland. And he told me that um, where they were doing this dam, it was actually in Labrador, uh, that the um, cafeteria for the workers that they'd set up as they progressed with the work, it got farther and farther apart, farther and farther away. And so it got to the point where it was a uh, like a five minute drive um, through their their makeshift roads to get to the cafeteria. And they looked at, well, it's it was something like uh, 40 or 50 thousand dollars to move the cafeteria. So then he thought, well, we're going to run the numbers and we're going to see, well, by moving it, what do we save? Well, they are talking a big project and it's hundreds of workers and uh he said it was so it was going to cost about fifty thousand to move but it was going to save them about six hundred thousand dollars by moving it so you have to run the numbers sometimes sometimes it's like oh well forget that we're not moving it forty thousand hmm. dollars i would i would spend the forty thousand to save six hundred thousand myself that would you know there's not too many stocks out there that you can put that kind of bet down on so um it's a it's a pretty logical analytical detailed way of looking at your projects not only just things like that having an organized toolbox with all of your tools as a trade a, a really good trade will be organized in a very very clean manner so they spend very little time going back and forth and they can spend more time being productive so there was just to back this up a little bit uh, with a, some pretty good sound uh, understanding. Um, so this is a, a, a research study that was done and how field employees spend their time. And as I said, there's different data out there. I find this data around this number fairly frequently. Um, so recover, so what we have is um, we've got primary time 42%. So that's actually doing value added work. So that's that's basically doing the work on the site that's going to be part of the building structure. This is your management. This is your uh, uh, managing of the projects, material handling, lay down area, site logistics setup. Uh, all of these things is 26%. The other 32% is waiting, work, work, waiting for workers and workers waiting for work, rework, you know, uh, wasted motion, all of these things that add up to lost time. And this is 32%. Some of the research in lean construction uh, methodologies uses a number that's much higher than this. It uses about 70% of the work, right? 
So um, depending on your number and depending how you're including things into the numbering, um, it's a pretty high number. It's not a small number. And I've never had where I do this to a group of site supers, PMs, that they start saying, there's no way we waste 32%. They kind of look like at least. They usually say at least. So with that said, that's not a necessarily a bad thing. But one of the things that's not too great is that over the past, uh, well, this says from 1995, this is in The Economist, but again, there's other research out there that's from 1960, pretty much follows the same trend line. Construction's been improving at about 1% um, productivity improvement per year um, since 1995, or really since about 1960. And in some reports, it shows it hasn't really been improving at all. If anything, it's been getting worse. Uh, total economy is around 3% and manufacturing is usually around 4% per year. So we're a laggard in that way. And there's reasons. There's some justifiable reasons. We deal with uh, uh, weather conditions. We don't have the same crews always working together. We do a, set up a project and we have people join up and we have to collaborate. We have to learn our, our foibles and all of those types of things. Uh, whereas in... Uh, a manufacturing plant it's a closed environment it's your workers you train them and uh, you keep uh, improving as the same type of products maybe with some variations that you're producing but there is a huge opportunity for us to be able to improve and there actually was this um, McKinsey Global Institute report study that was done and the um, report looked at all of these things that we're talking about and you can actually uh, go to it, you can Google it if you want, or you can click on the link um, from the slides. And one of the biggest recommendations uh, around this is uh, to adopt different contract models. So we talked about contract models, uh, uh, lump sum, cost plus, construction management. It really strongly recommends the integrated project delivery contract. Uh, it really strongly recommends lean construction methodologies. It really strongly recommends the, adapt, the adoption and adaptation of BIM uh, in construction, building information modeling. So these are all um, recommendations of change that needs to happen in the construction industry. And change is happening. And so that's why I've kind of had a theme on this uh, course is that you've got to be ready for this change and you've got to move and you've got to look at ways of being more productive and that way you'll be successful because if you're not doing it your competitors are so it's a great opportunity because there's so much waste i look at that as a big plus if i was standing here saying we've got one percent waste and we've got to get this down to half a percent waste it's not very enlightening or very motivating right but you say 32% waste, well, what if we got it down to 27% waste? And if we got it down to 27% waste, maybe we could get it down to 25% waste. And if we're improving like that, our business is gonna be pretty successful because we're gonna be doing better than our competition when they're only improving like 1% per year. So um, that's a huge opportunity the way I see it. And being kind of a, a business numbers person myself, I, I thought I'd put some, an example into a, um, in, into a financial model. So it's basically an income statement. And uh, what we're doing is we're looking at a construction company. It could be maybe it could be a subcontractor, right? We could say whoever it is. So um, if it was a mechanical subcontractor or something, uh, they have sales revenue of $100 million per year and their labor is $40 million. So they self-perform a lot of the work. And then they have materials, equipment. They have other subcontractors that they utilize. And so they have total costs of $86 million. So if we have $100 million and we have total costs of $86 million, our gross profit is $14 million. Gross profit includes overhead and profit. All right. Uh, so then if we take our overhead out. Now overhead, if you don't know, it's like the home office, it's stuff that you have to pay for whether you get this project or not. You know, like your trucks, um, your cell phones, uh, those are your, your overhead costs. It's like your estimators that estimate projects that you never get. You know, that would be an overhead cost. Uh, so that's your overhead, 10 million. So what you're left with uh, is 4 million, 
right? Uh, and you know what? Yeah, it's construction industry. You don't make as much as you think. So, four percent. If you're, if that's that's not an unreasonable number. Six percent, eight percent is not an unreasonable number. Uh, most construction companies they may make more on some projects, like they might make twelve percent, but then they end up losing like money on another project. So overall, in a year, with all their projects considered, um, they end up uh, maybe with four percent or six or eight percent, but typically not a lot more than that unless you're into development it's a little bit different in development so here what if we the next question is what if we improve just 10 percent just 10 percent on our labor just just a little bit right and so that would 10 percent of 40 million is 36 million everything else stays the same but we were able to improve our labor our productivity by 10 percent Look what it does to the bottom line. The previous one, the bottom line was 4 million. This one's now 8 million. The previous one was 4%. This is 8% profit. We just received a 100% improvement in our profit, right? We went from 4 million to 8 million by improving our labor by 10%. And some of you are skeptics. Yeah, 10%. That's a lot. What are we going to be running around doing? Well, if we take that example of the electrician, that was 10%. That was 10%. Right? So if we start looking on our projects very carefully, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Now, when you go out there, and if you're new into this field, if you kind of build in this way of looking at things critically, and observing things and trying to figure out how to do things more streamlined and more productively it just becomes part of the way you think you're going to be adding tremendous value to whoever you work for and trust me you will be the last one they'll ever want to let go of or you may really get a spark and decide to start your own business with that kind of philosophy and you'll be very successful in your careers so this is really an important function of site logistics and I think you really need to take this to heart because it is really important from that perspective to recall that and so even for those of you that are a little bit skeptical all right five percent fifty percent improvement in profit Not bad two percent twenty percent one percent ten percent in profit so wouldn't you have to do that really like you know uh, but going back there's a lot that don't going back to the McKinsey Global Institute report going back to the Economist magazine there's a lot of evidence out there that construction has not been doing that so it's a huge huge opportunity for us all if we think about it that way I've just broken it down a little detail there for you in one slide you can look on the slides for that. So um, productivity is a thing to consider. There's a lot of things to think about with it. Uh, I'm always looking at things, even if I'm at Davisville Subway, uh, and um, I see all of these people cutting the grass, and I'm like, there's a lot of people in that small area cutting the grass. And when it comes down to it, is everybody working? There's a lot of people talking and sort of standing around and not working. So, you know, you have, adding more people to an already late project may only make it later. That's Brooke's Law. It really came into being with uh, in the IT sector. But as you can see, you can put it in the landscaping sector and I could find uh, a lot of... Uh, examples in construction i think the problem is if i start taking pictures of people in construction standing around they get they get, kind of get hostile because uh, uh, they know what i'm doing um, but uh, definitely uh, you want to try to have a productive site and you don't want to have an overcrowded they call it stacking uh, when you have too many people there at one time or you fall behind on a project you bring a lot more people to quicken it up but it's not necessarily a linear relationship when you add more people. Um, probably the best way to think about that is I've got to dig a trench. It's going to take one person two weeks to dig a trench. So I get a second person. Now it should only take one week. Probably true. Uh, so I got two people digging a trench. I want to speed it up. 
I bring another two people. It should only take two and a half days, maybe. But if I continue, I got four people, two and a half days, eight people to, should take one and a quarter. Eight people, one and a quarter. If I get uh, 16 people, it should take five hours. So if I get uh, 32 people instead of 16 people, it should take two and a half hours. You see where it's going? It doesn't work at a certain point. In the beginning, yeah. So there's a, you have to understand your site and you have to understand what's appropriate and what's gonna improve the flow of work and where the limitations are. And that comes with experience, observation, tracking, uh, monitoring. Um, these are all helpful methods to use on your um, projects. So this is pretty much what I wanted to cover in lecture 5A. I find this topic truly fascinating uh, because it, it's just, it's just such an opportunity to improve and problem solve and figure things out. Um, so that's where project management, planning and scheduling, site management, site logistics, working with subcontractors, relationships, leadership, management, they all come together. So um, it is an exciting uh, area and uh, it's one that you should really sort of ponder and think about for a while. Read through the textbook chapter on that. Uh, when you take courses on project management, planning, scheduling, control, really sort of eat them up because this really comes into uh, the fold on those. And of course, uh, when you take labs and different things of that nature. So that's uh, what I wanted to cover today. And hopefully that, that makes sense for you. And we'll be back for lecture 5B, where we will be continuing on on this subject of job site layout and control. So I'm Tom Stevenson signing off for today and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.